Hello from Florida in the USA. Although we are still on shutdown, a lot of people are approaching me with questions now, so I decided to use some of my free time to address another very interesting one. On request of a very good and dear friend of mine who is an international tactical security expert and close protection officer, I was asked to address the issue of paintball guns or markers for personal defense. Hein is one of the most skilled and experienced operators I know and he was even featured in several episodes of a Discovery Channel series called Secret Bodyguards. Because of his experience, people who know him asked whether they are allowed to use a paintball gun as an optional for personal defense. He approached me and asked me to share my understanding of the subject since I have actually consulted on a case as an expert witness where a paintball gun was involved. Although pepper balls were used, it was a paintball gun nonetheless. To share a bit of background, the case I'm referring to happened back on the 19th of October in 2013. A client of mine and his wife were driving on a road in Santon, Johannesburg when they came across a small pickup parked in the road and some people having an argument in the street outside a nightclub. He hooted at the people to try to get them to clear the road. To this, the people entered their vehicle, a small pickup, and sped off. They drove down the road, made a U-turn, and sped back towards my client. Fearing they might run into him, as they passed, he took out his pepper ball gun and fired a shot at the offending vehicle, hitting the side window. Fortunately for us, the whole event was captured on CCTV cameras installed outside the club, so we were able to get copies of the video. On close analysis of the video footage, the car could be seen approaching, swerving at the last minute, my client pointing his paintball gun out of his window and firing a shot. A puff of pepper powder could be clearly seen on the video as it bounced off the glass. What was not captured on camera was that my client and his wife then left the area, but they were shortly pursued aggressively by the pickup with three male occupants inside. Fearing for their safety, my client's wife then called the police emergency number and reported the pursuit. They made several turns and went around a traffic circle before they reached the red traffic light where they were forced to stop. While they were still on the phone to the police, the pickup then rammed into the rear of my client's vehicle, reversed back and rammed into him again. To this, my client jumped out of his car and pointed his pepper ball gun at the pickup again in the hopes of stopping the attack. The attackers then backed up aggressively, colliding with the sidewall and damaging some of the wheels. The car sped off back in the direction where the confrontation started, essentially leaving the area. Still on the phone to the police, my client then tried to find the vehicle to report its details and came across a vehicle parked in the middle of the road and abandoned with its door still standing open. The occupants had exited and he saw one male running down the road, stumbling and falling, so he ignored him and remained at the scene at the vehicle with his wife, waiting for police to arrive. By the time police arrived, several bystanders had gathered. From among the bushes on the side of the road, the driver of the pickup appeared and came forward claiming to be a victim. The occupant that fell also arrived and they all followed the police office to the nearest police station. My client's paperball gun was examined by police officers and even test fired. Statements were also taken. My client laid charges at this time and he was allowed to leave after his paperball gun was returned back to him. He had the damages to his car repaired and expected to hear from detectives about this complaint or the one he filed. Almost a year later, my client was informed to his shock and horror that he was being charged with attempted murder and for several offenses under the Firearm Control Act. Apparently because the way in which he used his paintball marker was an offense in terms of that act. From records, it was learned that all three of the occupants of the pickup had presented similar statements describing my client as the aggressor and claiming that he had shot into their car, breaking their side window and exposing them to pepper powder. According to their version, they had to stop, exit the vehicle, recover from the pepper powder and only later encountered my client again as he confronted them where the police found their vehicle. They made no mention of the pursuit, the collision, or their actions during that time. 
they allegedly fled for their lives. So our immediate concern was whether the pepper ball gun could even break a side window of a vehicle of the kind involved, as they claimed. To this, we purchased some side windows of an exemplar vehicle and proceeded to do some ballistic testing. In this case, with a Tipman TPX pepper ball gun, one designed and sold by some as a personal defense solution. We first completed the test with a projectile most likely to shatter car glass, ceramic balls. It was immediately found that these could shatter the glass at a distance of 2 meters or 6 feet. Our further tests also immediately revealed that even at the distance of 2 meters or 6 feet, the pepper ball projectiles could not penetrate the glass and simply dispersed as a cloud of power exactly as seen on the video evidence. But let's turn to the Firearms Control Act or Act 60 of 2000 as amended. In this case, we were specifically interested in Chapter 3, where the devices specifically excluded from the Act are discussed. The Act covers several types of items like bolt guns used for killing animals humanely, power tools, tranquilizer firearms, and flare guns, etc. But it also specifically mentions and excludes paintball guns. This would explain why this device can be sold and purchased and why you would not need to apply for a firearm license to own one. But then the act becomes interesting as the trial unfolded and as additional elements were argued. Now one of the occupants, the man that fell, later claimed my client pursued him, forced him to his knees and shot him in the back of the head causing him to lose consciousness. This escalated the matter and when you refer to chapter 16 of the act where offences are considered, you will find that section 120b specifically includes mention of, and I quote, it is an offence to point anything which is likely to lead a person to believe that it is a firearm, an antique firearm or an air gun at any person without good reason to do so. The Act further mentions the following. The behaviour of the person including the making of any threat or the display of intimidatory behaviour. Yet, as far as the evidence was concerned, the ballistics expert for the state completely agreed with my interpretation of the video. We both found that no windows broke and that only a pepper ball was fired. So in the end, despite all his explanations, despite facing three assailants while being alone with his wife and fleeing, despite being on the phone with the police, reporting the ongoing dispute and despite denying to ever have shot or hit an actual person, my client was actually found guilty and convicted of a violation of the Firearms Control Act. Now I'd like to also discuss the issue of choice. I'd like to share my thoughts on whether it is even a good idea to use a paintball gun as an alternative to a real firearm. As this case illustrates, the law can be interpreted in a variety of ways. Paintball guns and paperball guns can be sold and bought. That's totally legal. You can own one have one and even take it around with you. But the minute you use it as if it is a firearm, you have to accept the possibility, the likelihood even, that the way in which you use it would expose you to charges under law. When the law states that it would be an offence to use any device that could reasonably be perceived to be a firearm, it makes no exception between whether the impression is created in the mind of a victim or an attacker. If you go and testify that you used it to try and scare the attacker away, you have essentially confessed to converting its status from a device specifically excluded from the act to a device specifically covered in it. My advice would be rather to limit the ownership and use of a paintball gun or pepperball gun to personal defense inside your home, a place where the presence of an attacker establishes them as the offender and where your choice of defense is more easily justified. I would never personally carry a paintball gun or a paperball gun around with me for the sole purpose of using it as a tool to intimidate or scare anyone since it can do little else anyway. You see, if your life is so much in danger that you need to display or brandish something that looks like a gun you probably should have a real firearm. If it's not bad enough to require the use of an actual firearm and you merely want to use it to scare someone, you'll probably just get into trouble with it in any event, as my client learned most unfortunately.
Besides the obvious risks illustrated in this example, I would also be concerned about the reaction of an actual attacker. Imagine pointing a paintball gun at an armed attacker and then that attacker returning fire with a real firearm under the argument of necessity to save his own life, whether justified or not. As I close, I would also like to add that obviously airsoft guns that are clearly designed to look and feel exactly like real guns should also never be worn, carried, presented, pointed or used as if they are real firearms for the same reasons and specifically considering the Firearms Act. Thank you for your time and I sincerely hope you found this educational and informative. Stay safe and think twice before using any toys or any tools as if they are a real firearm. Thank you.